Well, right, welcome to some <clears throat> video notes on the last section of topic eight. We'll be looking at 8.3, uh, similar to when we did cellular respiration, breaking it up into a series of steps uh, where there are a bunch of different reactions in those different steps. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for photosynthesis. So we're essentially going to divide it in half, dividing it in between the light dependent reactions and the light independent reactions. And so this first video will just be looking at the dependent reactions where light is the primary reason why the uh, whole reactions are occurring. You have failed me for the last time. We've got a lot of content that we're going to go through, uh, mostly about half of the material on this slide. We're going to be looking at our light and dependent reactions and how the thylakoid membrane is structured. We'll be talking about NADP and ATP. Uh, which is an electron uh, transport protein and you know of course ATP is a source of energy. Uh, we'll be talking about the absorption of light by what we call photosystems. We'll be talking about photolysis which is where we uh, use light energy to basically split water into oxygen, hydrogen, and electrons. Uh, we'll be talking about the the plant's version of the ETC or how electrons are going to be moved through the thylakoid membrane. Uh, we'll talk about how the photosystem 2 is used to create ATP. Uh, and then again, yeah, ATP synthase as well, and ultimately what happens to our electrons in photosystem one. Now all these make up the light dependent reactions, which eventually lead into the light independent reactions, which come in a later video. Uh, we'll also, in addition to this, first be looking at just some general information about the chloroplast, how is the chloroplast shaped, and what does it have, why is it structured the way that it is in order for it to do photosynthesis. So just to make sure that you're all understanding what we're talking about when we talk about photosynthesis, to go through this equation again. So you should memorize this equation. So maybe you can pause it and just kind of write it out and see if you, if you test yourself. But you've already memorized the equation for photosynthesis, which is the idea of carbon dioxide, specifically six carbon dioxide, being or combined with uh, six water molecules to create, uh, with the power of sunlight, to create glucose, which is C6H12O6, and of course, six oxygen molecules. Now, the thing that we think about is where do these uh, reactants actually end up in terms of our products? Our carbon actually ends up going through the process of carbon fixation. So the CO2 that's in the air around you ultimately gets put into the uh, fats and proteins and sugars that you eat. So that's how the cycle of carbon is being maintained. Um, the oxygen that's in CO2 also ends up as the oxygen inside of the sugar that you eat. And the hydrogen that's in the sugars that you eat comes from the water that is around you. And so ultimately your source of oxygen is from the water when it goes through the process of photolysis. So this is our general structure of photosynthesis, our just general equation. So make sure you understand the products and the reactants. And as we move forward, you're going to see the specific steps that are happening here. And there are a lot of steps. Now, just like when we talk about the mitochondria, if you're going to understand what's happening when we go through the light dependent and independent reactions, you need to know the lingo of the different structures, the different parts of the chloroplast. So you should be able to label a diagram or draw your own diagram and label it. We start on the outer part of it. We have what we have would be our series of membranes, or an, an inner and outer membrane, which we can collectively just call the envelope. So our envelope or outer inner membranes. Then we have the open space that's on the inside of the chloroplast, which is called the stroma. So if you remember for the mitochondria, we called this the mitochondrial matrix. For the chloroplast, it's called the stroma. This is where we would find ribosomes and the DNA, because remember, just like the mitochondria, chloroplasts used to be prokaryotes before they went through the endosymbiotic system of becoming a living functioning part of eukaryotic cells. They used to be independent, so they have their own ribosomes and in fact their own DNA as well. Uh, the stroma is also going to be the location of the light independent reactions. So in the next video, we're going to talk about lots of things happening uh, in the stroma. The dark green foldy lines that we see inside, that's the thylakoid membrane. And then when we take those membranes and we fold them back and forth on each other, we can create little stacks that we call granulum. So the thylakoid membrane, as you're going to see today, is going to be the site of the light dependent reactions. And just like the chloroplasts, which have the folded inner membrane back and forth forming the cristiae, more folded membrane means more surface area, which means more chemistry can be happening at the same time, which makes the mitochondria more efficient. 
The same thing applies to the chloroplasts. The reason why the thylakoid membranes are folded back and forth like that, and the reason why we have granula uh, forming in the chloroplast is to increase the amount of surface area so there's more uh, light-dependent reactions happening at the same time. Then sometimes you can see sometimes they show up very, very dark depending on the image, or sometimes they show up like lighter images or light spots if, it's, if the image is colored. But those are also what we would think of energy supplies. So remember, um, again, the mitochondria and the chloroplast used to be prokaryotes. They're independent living organisms. They also have the ability to just kind of store energy in the form of oil droplets or starch grains. And so we can see some of the products of photosynthesis being kept inside the chloroplast, not really going out to other parts of the plant. Uh, as a source of energy for the chloroplast, as it goes through this process, it's going to need some energy as well, and at points when you know the sunlight's not very bright, you know, or it's it's you know winter time and they're going more dormant phase. Possibly the chloroplasts are going to need additional help and start breaking down their own energy source that they've been building up over time. So the key thing when we talk about photosynthesis is that because we are breaking it down into two sets of reactions, the light dependent and the light independent. You need to understand what are the reactants and what are the products of both of them, and then that will help you link them together. <clears throat> it's, very, <clears throat> it's very similar to the idea of cellular respiration. We talked about glycolysis. Glycolysis was going to create pyruvate, which is then going to have to be used by the link reaction. In the link reaction, we end up with acetyl-CoA, which is then going to be used by the Krebs cycle. And then all three of those things are producing NADH and FADH2, which will then be used by the ETC in order to make lots of energy. So there's going to be numerous steps going through the process of photosynthesis, and so we need to make sure you understand what are the reactants and products at the different points in these steps. So our light dependent reactions are where we're going to see photolysis and photophosphorylation. So photolysis, of course, is the breaking of water using uh, light energy. And photophosphorylation is the idea of something being phosphorylated, substrate level phosphorylation. But because it's mostly driven by something that its uh, ultimate source comes from light, or the ultimate reason for it comes from light, they call it photophosphorylation because it's kind of powered by light energy or radiant energy. So that means through this process, what we'll be getting is water will be going in. We're going to be using an electron and hydrogen carrier, which is NADP+. So if you remember NAD from, the from um, uh, cellular respiration, right? NAD, right? It's the same exact molecule, uh, almost the same exact molecule, slightly different, but it does the same exact thing. It's there to move electrons and hydrogens around and protect them so that they only get used in very specific chemical reactions. However, for photosynthesis, the molecule is slightly different, and so we also add this P on to it to distinct whether or not we're talking about cellular respiration or we're talking about photosynthesis. Now, this is very important. Do not make this mistake on an exam. If they're talking about cellular respiration, it's NAD. If they're talking about photosynthesis, it's NADP, right? If you want to talk about photosynthesis, you have to write NADP. If you write NAD in a question that's about photosynthesis, you are wrong, even though you've got most of the name of it correct. So you need to make sure you're very careful about talking about this molecule because it is, again, very similar to the one we talked about in cellular respiration. <coughs> Sorry. And then we also have uh, ADP because we're going to phosphorylate it to make ATP, to make some energy that we can use later. So coming out of this, we'll get oxygen, right? So the oxygen from water ends up in the O2. We're going to end up with some NADPH. So the electrons and the hydrogens are going to end up here in our NADPH. And then through this process, we're going to generate a little bit of energy, and we're going to have an ATP synthase convert ADP into ATP. All right, so we have oxygen, NADPH, and ATP. Now, ultimately, oxygen is going to get released. Right? So the oxygen can be used for aerobic respiration in the mitochondria, but plants are not very metabolically active. They grow very slowly. They don't have a lot of movements like we do. So most of the oxygen actually becomes a waste product. They don't really need it. So they open up their stomata and eventually the oxygen just diffuses out of the plants. And that's great for us because that's what we really need in order to stay alive. But the NADPH and the ATP are important and we're going to use those as the next part in our light independent reactions. So in the light independent reactions is where we see carbon fixation, the building of carbon molecules, the 
Calvin cycle, and ultimately the synthesis of glucose or fats or proteins, basically any type of source of energy. Again, to keep things simple, we're going to just stick to um, glucose as our example. So carbon dioxide is going to be part of this. That's our source of carbon and our source of oxygens in order to make the carbohydrates. NADPH from our light dependent reactions are going to come down, and the energy source, ATP, is also going to come down and do those series of reactions. So now that we've got those, ultimately when we get out of this is glucose phosphate, which is the building block for making a glucose. It's not necessarily the full glucose. Or, oh, sorry, glucose phosphate. Um, uh, it's... It's the beginning part of a glucose, right? So then we can use that energy, that phosphate energy, to start building a, a molecule like sucrose or something. We can add the glucose onto other glucose, for example. But ultimately, we end up making a glucose. Uh, we end up making NADP+, right? We get it back so that it can be recycled back into this process and be reused again. And we end up with ADP because we use the energy. So we also can recycle the ADP back into this system. So we constantly are using... Uh, water and oxygen and CO2, or sorry, water and CO2 producing oxygen, and then we cycle the NADP and the ADP through this process to ultimately end us with glucose that we need in order for the plant, you know, to produce energy and survive, or nutrition and survive. So now let's start in some more detail about what's actually happening during the dependent reactions. So essentially, light dependent reactions, we say that they're light dependent because they are dependent on light. If light is not present, the whole process shuts down. So plants are only able to do the light dependent reactions when there is enough daylight around them, enough sunlight or you know, enough artificial light if they're growing inside. And so what they will use the light energy to split water right, through a process called photolysis. And by doing this, it will be able to get the hydrogen ions, or it will be able to get energy containing electrons, and it will use those to form NADPH and ultimately ATP through ATP synthase, so that those can be used in the next series of reactions, the independent reactions. So NADPH, yeah, so, and then we also produce oxygen as a waste product. So light's coming in, it's going to pass through the plant, it's going to pass through the leaves, it's going to pass through all of the plant cells. I mean, light's pretty good at moving through material, it's got a lot of energy in it. It's going to pass through the chloroplast, through the, through the outer membranes, and then it's going to hit the thylakoid membrane. And the thylakoid membrane is where we have this, a series of photorecepting systems. And those systems are going to be able to use the light energy as it moves through the plant material as it moves through the membranes uh, to order to power everything that we're going to talk about in the next few phases. So water comes in, but ultimately oxygen is what's going to be leaving. NADP plus is going to come in, but ultimately NADPH is what's going to be leaving. And of course, ADP is going to come through and create ATP. So now we need to zoom in on this and talk about what is actually happening in this membrane and go through the individual steps of uh, the light dependent reaction. So we're going to zoom into just a single part of the thylakoid membrane. The thylakoid membrane has these, you know, proteins in this kind of setup repeating, you know, over and over and over again, thousands and thousands of times. So we're just going to look at one section, one um, series of proteins, and talk about what's actually happening as we go through this process. So it's in the thylakoid membrane, so that means we have the stroma on one side, right, the open space, and then we have the inner thylakoid membrane space. So just like we had the inner membrane space in the mitochondria, there is an inner, uh, uh, inner thylakoid space. So this would be a small little gap, and then here might be this yellow line being the, the membrane of the other side of the thylakoid, if it was like a nice extension, right? And then we'd have more proteins and things like that in this side, like this, right? So it might have something, oops, something like this on the other side. So the thylakoid membrane is just a really, really small space in between, I'm sorry, thylakoid space is just a really small space between the membranes, and it's there also to help maintain concentration gradients, which you're going to see as we go through this whole process. And so this should actually start to seem really, really similar to how the ETC works. So first in our system, we have PS2, which actually doesn't mean PlayStation. It means photosystem, 
Photosystem 2. Now, you're probably wondering why is it start with Photosystem 2, and later you're going to see there's a Photosystem 1. It's because Photosystem 1 was discovered and understood first, and so they thought, oh, this is our first Photosystem. Uh, and then later they discovered and understood Photosystem 2. So uh, since they named one 1, they had to call the other one 2 because 1 came first. But actually, you're starting with Photosystem 2, not starting with Photosystem 1. Next to Photosystem 2 is going to be a proton pump that's going to be responsible for moving hydrogen ions across the membrane in order to create a concentration gradient that will be used by ATP synthase. Then will come Photosystem 1. Photosystem 1 is going to be responsible of working with another protein called ferredoxin here. And so together they will produce NADPH. They will take used hydrogen ions and NADP plus and combine them to make NADPH. And then finally, we have ATP synthase, which of course is responsible for generating ATP. So we have these two in the beginning. Their role is to set up concentration gradients and to get things ready for the later two, these ones, to create NADH, NADPH, sorry, and ATP. So now let's look at the individual steps that each one of them are going to go through. What are the actual processes of the light-dependent reactions? So first, it's all going to start with light. And so inside the photosystems, we have chlorophyll, which remember, those are those pigments. There's actually lots of different pigments, but the main pigment inside our photosystems are going to be chlorophyll. And so chlorophyll is going to be able to absorb light energy. As light energy hits the chlorophyll, uh, rather than it passing through it or reflecting it, it will be absorbed into the molecule. And when this happens, there are electrons inside of the chlorophyll that the chlorophyll is kind of holding on to. And so it will energize these electrons through what we call photoactivation, right? Activation like being energized, right? And then photoactivation meaning that, that light is the one that's causing the energy to occur. So the, when this occurs, the electron is going to basically become a high energy electron. And so then we can use the high energy electron moving through the thylakoid membrane being passed by a series of proteins, just like, like we saw in the ETC, we can use that energy in order to power the next part, which is our um, protein pump, which is going to move hydrogen ions from one place to another. Now, the thing is, this whole system would shut down if we didn't do the next part, which is photolysis. So the thing is, is that chlorophyll is only really holding on to a few electrons, it only has a few electrons available. Right? If it does this photoactivation, this electron is going to leave the chlorophyll. And so if it leaves the chlorophyll, the chlorophyll can't do this again because it just lost the electron that it needed in order to do the photoactivation. So that's why it's really important that the next part so occurs. So what happens as well is because of this high energy electron, this process going on inside the chlorophyll, we also see the process of photolysis. And so there's an enzyme attached to the photosystem too, and it's a hydrolytic enzyme, which means hydro meaning water, lytic meaning to cut. So it's an enzyme that will cut water. And so because the light has been absorbed by this electron and this electron has been moved out of the chlorophyll, there is a signal for the enzyme, the hydrolytic enzyme, to take water that's present and to break it apart. And by doing this, by photolysising the water, it breaks it up into an oxygen and hydrogen ions. And then the electrons that were present on the hydrogen atoms, each of the electrons, so two electrons, will go into the chlorophyll to replace the electron that we lost. So we keep supplying PS2, we keep supplying the chlorophyll with more electrons by getting electrons from water doing hydrolysis. This is also important because we get a bunch of these hydrogen ions, which we're going to need in order to power ATP synthase later on. So it's also great, not only are we getting electrons replaced, but we're producing hydrogen ions which are necessary for making ATP. Ultimately, when two oxygen atoms are present, the two oxygen atoms will come together to create O2, and then that becomes oxygen gas, and you know, oxygen gas can either leave the plant or it can be used by the mitochondria. The energy electron that was in our chlorophyll, as it passes through the membrane, it's going to release that energy, and here it's going to hit our proton pump. And the proton pump is important, don't get them confused. It's going to take hydrogen ions from the stroma and move them into the thylakoid space, from the stroma to the thylakoid space.
So this is going to start to create a concentration gradient. Here we would have a very low concentration because we keep removing hydrogen ions. Here we'd have a very high concentration, not only because we're moving hydrogen ions into this space through active transports, but because of the extra hydrogen ions that are coming from the photolysis of water. So we will create a very, very high concentration gradient between the thylakoid space and the stroma because of this proton pump and because of photolysis happening inside the thylakoid space here. So ultimately, those proton pumps, as they build up inside of the thylakoid space, they're going to be responsible for generating the energy that will turn ATP synthase and make ATP later on. So from this point, we now enter what we call non-cyclic phosphorylation. A non-cyclic phosphorylation means that we're basically following what they also might call a Z scheme. So Z schemes where it's like energy energized and then drops, energized and then drops and ends up in our, uh, let me erase that, do it again. Energized and drops, energized, and then it ends up here inside of our NAD. PH is where the electrons go. So this idea it follows kind of a Z pattern as it goes up and down in energy moving through the membrane. We're talking about the electron going up and down in energy. So this Z scheme is non-cyclic photophosphorylation, which basically means it's the normal form of photosynthesis, constantly making ATP and constantly making NADPH. So the second half of what we go through with our light dependent reactions would be the ATP synthase and the PS1, the photosystem 1, creating an ATPH. Starting with ATP synthase, it's going to function just like it did back when we talked about it in the ETC. So we have a high concentration of hydrogen ions on one side, we have a very low concentration of hydrogen ions on the other side, and so they are just going to naturally diffuse through the ATP synthase protein, creating this chemiosmosis, this force, right, as they turn the ATP synthase protein, and through the rotation of the ATP synthase protein, they're going to power the formation of ATP from uh, ADP and a inorganic phosphate. So if you don't quite remember all this, you can go and uh, look at the electron transport chain video again, or you can go Google some videos that, that just kind of run through the animation of what ATP synthase looks like as it goes through this whole process. But again, it's very similar to what we talked about in the mitochondria. So if you really remember that fairly well, then just think of it. Only now we're going to be using that ATP for continuing on the process of photosynthesis rather than, you know, using it as a, a source of energy inside of the cell for other chemists chemical reactions that other types of metabolism. The only thing that's left now though is to talk about where NADPH comes from and so that's what's going to be happening in photosystem one. So if you remember here we had uh, here we had photosystem two right and so we had high energy electrons move from photosystem two then I mean it, move from photosystem 2, then go into our proton pump, and the energy was used by the proton pump. And so that electron continues on, but there's not a, real, a lot of energy left in it anymore because we use that energy in order to power the proton pump that moved hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoid space. So we need to re-energize these electrons. So photosystem 1, just like photosystem 2, has pigments inside of it, like chlorophyll, that can absorb energy, right, some, this, the radiant energy, and put it into these electrons. And so when this happens, these electrons coming in, going through the similar process that we saw in photosystem 2, get absorbed by, or get uh, um, radiant energy um, kind of put into them through the chlorophyll, and so their, their energy levels increase, and then they get passed on to ferredoxin. And what ferredoxin is going to do is going to take that energy, right, and it's going to combine the high energy electrons with any random hydrogen ions left over after its ATP synthesis used them. And so it will take NADP plus and these hydrogen ions and these electrons as well, these energy, high energy electrons that we just produced, and then that will form our NADPH. And so then later on, NADPH and ATP, they're now located inside of the stroma and they're ready to move on and be used by the next um, series of reactions, which would be our light independent reactions.
And so just talking about this idea about the different types of pigments, if you remember earlier in, two, in topic two, we talked about absorption spectrum and we talked about action spectrum. And again, want to remind you about what those mean. So the absorption spectrum is basically the rate of photosynthesis at those wavelengths where the uh, uh, that the action spectrum the absorption spectrum is the absorbance of the light of the, those different pigments so when we look at both the absorption spectrum and the action spectrum on top of each other here we see peaks of different photosystems so for example photosystem 2 peaks here at 680 nanometers so sometimes it's called ps680 to remember that it's 680 nanometers and PSS uh, photosystem one peaks at 700 nanometers which we will call PS you can also call it PS 700 but we do have a wide range of pigments present as well so even though the photosystems are mostly relying on pigmentation or forms of pigments that absorb best the orange red light there are other supporting pigments that also fill up the violet blue section so that they can help them absorb as much energy as possible. And what this actually comes from is that the main um, chlorophyll that's responsible for doing the actual energizing of the electrons, the energizing of the electrons is done by a chlorophyll that really only activates to 680 or 700, depending on if it's PS2 or PS1. However, that doesn't mean that it only will accept wavelength energy from that uh, wavelength or energy from that wavelength. It can absorb wavelengths from other pigments uh, to make it more efficient. So if energy is absorbed from this end of the spectrum, all right, because these, chlor these pigments are really close to each other, the energy can actually be physically passed around from pigment to pigment, eventually getting to the chlorophyll and then as the energy builds up in the chlorophyll even though it's not a, a, the exact 680 nanometer uh, wavelength it's still getting energy from other wavelengths and then that energy goes into the electrons which makes it more efficient so that's one of the reasons why plants have so many different pigments is because really the photosystems are best are only really working at their at their optimum at two specific wavelengths but they can still absorb more energy from around them from different wavelengths by using the supporting pigments okay so that's the first half oh yeah sorry and yeah so the the photosystems also, this is just saying again, they have different portions of different types of pigments is really what I was just saying. Okay, so that's it for photosynthesis. Um, it, not photosynthesis, that's it for the first part of photosynthesis, the light dependent reactions. So now we're going to move on to light independent reactions. And if you have any questions, please let me know.